This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to find out how you can get 85% off and three months extra for free. Hey hey, Mark S. House with you here, and what a week it has been with Starship development and the upcoming testing of the SN4. The SN5 and also segments we suspect belong to the SN6 are being rapidly constructed at the same time, so things are screaming along at Boca Chica. A huge announcement with NASA awarding lunar lander contracts to Dynetics, SpaceX with a new modified Starship design, and Blue Origin leading a national team with their grand plan. Some awesome news with the Starlink project and future ways to limit reflectivity to be tested hopefully on the next launch. So that is exciting and we also celebrate Hubble's 30th year exploring the universe. Okay Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. We left off last week with Starship awaiting its pressure tests down at the launch site. Since then, of course, we've seen the very first successful pressure tests of the full tank section. First came the ambient pressure test, which ran well into the night. The tanks were filled with nitrogen gas for that run, and it was a complete success. So step one out of the way there. So by this stage, we knew that the SN4 would be continuing on to the all-important next test phase, the cryogenic pressure test, where liquid nitrogen is used to pressurize and simulate the necessary levels expected during a real flight. SN4 passed this critical development milestone being the first full stack prototype to do so. Cryogenic testing of course gives us a realistic indication of the readiness of Starship's construction moving forward. So yes, there was great anticipation in the lead up to the cryogenic test and when it was all over, Elon sent a tweet here and I've got a feeling he was just as relieved as we all were and there was plenty of pucker factor to go with this test after what we all witnessed with the SN1 and the SN3. At one stage, Elon also provided some footage from the underside of the SN4 during the cryo test. This was an incredible shot with Elon announcing that it was snowing in Texas. Interestingly, the cryo pressure test went up to 4.9 bar and Elon sent a tweet saying that this test was kind of a softball, but it's enough to fly. Better to play it safe at this point and preserve the vehicle for as much testing data as possible. The next step eagerly awaited was of course the static fire of a single Raptor engine. Here here, we see the hydraulic ram structure being dismantled, presumably to be used at a later stage for the next iterations of the Starship to be tested. This made room, of course, for all of the work involved in preparing for the installation of the Raptor engine. This is an event that we haven't seen since the preparations of the Starhopper, a static fire of the Raptor engine mounted to a Starship prototype. We were all very excited to finally see this happen again in preparation of the potential test hop of this SN4. Interestingly as well, it looks like Starhopper Hopper nearby has had a new added role to play at the launch site. There has been quite a lot of tinkering going on with the little beast, but it turns out now that at least one of those new roles will be filming because we've now spotted these cameras mounted in preparation of the static fire, test flights, and more than likely some potential mishaps. It's going to be great to see some footage from the perspective of Starhopper for all of these new flight tests, and they may be coming more rapidly too because there is a load of activity with the next iterations of the Starship prototypes. With all the excitement around SN4 lately and its achievements, it's amazing to see SN5 close behind waiting for its time to shine as well. Currently, it's looking like most of the parts needed for the SN5 were all there ready to be stacked. We all had our predictions of when we'd see a more complete stack of the SN5 come together, but we were also a little unsure how many of the segments we were seeing that could perhaps be for the SN6 version. The SN5 is currently expected to have all three Raptors fitted, but we're still not sure on the actuated fins at at this point. Elon Musk suggested a few weeks ago that either the SN5 or SN6 would get flaps, but based on more recent tweets, we're expecting the SN5 may still indeed be a Pathfinder prototype. The design and construction changes continue as expected with each iteration of the Starship. It really is truly amazing watching the engineering going on here by SpaceX. Elon said earlier in the week that the thrust dome is being redesigned as well as switching to a new 300 series alloy. So yes, we can't wait to see the SN5 on the test stand soon and see it as well go on to achieve a higher hop test as we close in on the eventual 20km flight destined for a later Starship version. 
Raptor development continues to pick up the pace as well. Elon recently commented on the complexities of producing Raptor engines comparing to designing them. It's interesting to note that SpaceX are now past the Raptor SN26 from a few weeks ago, finishing an engine every two weeks or so it seems at this point. This is quite the improvement in production time compared to the second half of 2019, with an engine completed on average every 17 days or so. Elon did reiterate that as usual for most things, building the production system for the Raptor engine is greater than 1000% harder than designing it in the first place. This is still going to mean that the Super Heavy is quite some time away from construction, but for now the facility at Boca Chica is well positioned for rapid production of suborbital starships. We suspect there are a number of production line iterations going on behind the scenes with the Raptor engine that have probably slowed the output there to what Elon was expecting last year. Now I've got a video here talking more about Elon's presentation from that talk last September. While you're here of course please do consider subscribing, there is loads more news coming with Crew Dragon and Starlink as well and I'd love to share all that with you. Now some big news late this week with NASA announcing that they've selected three US companies to design and develop crew landing solutions for use in the Artemis program. One of these vessels will then be chosen for production and used to put the next set of boots on the surface of the moon by 2024 and SpaceX are one of those selected. What was an immediate surprise was a new proposed variant of the Starship. Now this familiar looking vessel was shown with a few interesting differences, most noteworthy being that there are no aero surfaces on this at all. This suggests that this version of the Starship is not intended to return to Earth. Now apart from the render accompanying the announcement, NASA included two other major hints that this may be the case. First of all, SpaceX's proposal includes an uncrewed demo landing mission within their fixed price bid, and secondly, SpaceX will also include an in-flight propellant transfer demonstration. They're going to show that they can refuel their lander in space. Now in line with the Artemis program, the Starship lander is likely proposed to ferry astronauts from a lunar gateway to the surface of the moon and back depending on how the mission architecture develops. Another logical suggestion here would be for the crew to dock and transfer from Orion to the Starship lander in low Earth orbit and then re-enter the capsule for a return to Earth at the end of the mission. But then of course the render suggests that Starship will be more than capable of ferrying the crew and cargo for the entire mission. It's an interesting idea here because we've heard a number of skeptics about a moon mission with Starship recently talk about the dangers of such a high powered vessel landing on a body with no atmosphere. The exhaust velocity alone with the Raptors could be enough to throw material into lunar orbit. But here's the thing, this craft here does appear to have smaller landing engines presumably designed for the low gravity of the moon. This would help mitigate that issue. It's also worth noting of course that the vessel would need an extremely flat and solid landing location being the very tall vessel design that it is. I'm wondering if there would really need to be a landing pad or at least a partially prepared landing area for this to be completely feasible for early moon landing missions. Now along with SpaceX, Blue Origin was selected as the lead of a national team and they'll be providing a similar looking concept to the Blue Moon vehicle presented by Jeff Bezos in 2019 for the Descent vehicle. Lockheed Martin will be developing a reusable Ascent vehicle, Northrop Grumman the transfer element and Draper will be looking after the Descent guidance and the avionics systems. There are obviously a lot of companies here within this one award so their collective slice of the pie is much bigger. This integrated lander vehicle is a three stage lander which is intended to be launched on Blue Origin's upcoming new Glenn rocket along with United Launch Alliance's Vulcan. The third selected for an award was the Dynetics Human Landing System which is an option that will provide a crew module capable of descent and ascent from the moon and this would launch on the Vulcan as well. This craft appears to show more of a low to the ground outpost design that provides crew with ease of access to the moon's surface. Indeed Dynetics are focusing on habitat and aiming for the ability to support two crew for a week on the surface. Alternatively, the landing system can be used to ferry four suited crew as a transport craft as well. This lander includes a set of drop tanks that are jettisoned once used up and that should allow the main lander vehicle to be reused. It's all an effort to make these systems reusable where practical. Now Eric Berger here tweeted out these figures saying that Blue Origin was awarded 579 million, the team at Dynetics 253 million and SpaceX again with a much lower figure at 135 million. Now 
Jim Bridenstine has stated that the awards do not reflect ranking or preference, but were awarded based on their amount requested by each of the providers and the scope of their individual proposed work. He did specifically add that some people might look at the dollar amounts and think that NASA are playing favourites, and they're certainly not, is what he's saying there. So yes, this is exciting stuff. Interestingly though, Boeing didn't get an offer here, and I believe that they were intending to put in for this, so I would have thought that by default an award would have been offered there. But yes, I'm interested to know what you all think about this. Let me know in the comments. Now, there has been an interesting announcement by Elon this week about a new sun visor to help mitigate the amount of sunlight reflectivity from orbiting Starlink satellites. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but before that, this week's sponsor. Now, you all know how this works. To spend the time I do to research, edit, and create this content for everyone, funding and support is super important. And today, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, who have been huge supporters of my channel. A VPN or virtual private network allows you the potential to truly open up the internet. Have you exhausted content to stream while being cooped up at home? Well, with Surfshark VPN, you can quite literally open up a world of new content to digest from all around the world previously locked to you. Simply change the country you're accessing accessing the internet from, and boom, you now appear to be browsing from that location and have access to new libraries to digest. This also allows access to social platforms and external news services that have perhaps been restricted from you. With your IP address, your behavior is tracked for marketing purposes all over the internet. Ever wonder why you're seeing an ad for a product you looked at just the week before? With a VPN, you can mask your activity and avoid this data being provided, not only to marketing companies, but data mining services, internet service providers, or perhaps even from those around you who may have very differing personal views or beliefs. The internet should be a log-free open hub of knowledge, and by using Surfshark VPN, you can take control of your online security and visibility. And not only that, they're the only VPN service to offer one account to use on an unlimited number of devices. If you would like to support my channel and are also considering a VPN or even changing your existing VPN, go to surfshark.deals and you will get 85% off and three extra months for free. With a 30 day money back guarantee there's no risk in trying it out for yourself the link is in the description below now since the launch of Starlink last week there has been no shortage of traffic to come from my older videos explaining how the network will be deployed many of these comments come from communities all over the world seeing amazing scenes of Starlink satellite trains crossing the sky worrying about the brightness of them and also not realizing that while in the initial orbit raising mode they are much much brighter than when operational Elon announced a new sun visor this week which aims to help mitigate the amount of reflectivity from orbiting Starlink satellites. This they are calling VisorSat, which would involve blocking the sunlight using materials that would not interfere with the signal. Elon Musk gave a few other insights to this, saying that it's made of a special dark foam that's extremely radio transparent so as to not affect the phased array antennas. In fact, it looks a lot like a car sun visor. Now, SpaceX seem to have been very proactive in their efforts to address the concerns of astronomers and the community in this regard. Previously, SpaceX attempted to reduce the brightness of the satellites with an experiment dark sat treatment that was included as a test article with the launch from January this year. What they did there was use a darkening treatment over many of the reflective surfaces. That had shown quite a reduction in the reflectivity, but the new VisorSat solution aims to beat this with Elon saying that this is even better and is similar to giving the satellite shades. He also mentioned that the foam will deploy right after the satellite is released, essentially flipping out to block the sun and prevent reflections which should have a massive effect in the brightness of the Starlink satellites. SpaceX has the next launch predicted within the next few weeks, and it's apparently planning to test this new VisorSat idea on that next mission. Elon did say that this is a bit of a challenge, but that's the current goal. I'm assuming they're likely to have just a small number of these satellites with this new visor, but I haven't seen any information confirming how many will be on this new test system. If you've seen anything, please do let us know in the comments below. Another interesting comment was that SpaceX plans to lessen the reflectivity further with an orientation roll to adjust the satellite's alignment as they raise the orbits. There's quite a lot more detail on SpaceX's website explaining all of this in more detail as well, if you're interested. So yes, this is already looking very promising at minimizing the amount of reflections visible from the ground. There's no doubt that Elon and the team will find a much more suitable solution to this issue as they work with others in the scientific community while continuing, of course, to roll out the Starlink satellites. 
This new network is going to be incredible, providing global internet services to even the most remote locations. Now, the booster from last week's launch of Starlink returns safe and sound as well. These amazing photos by Greg Scott really puts the scale of the Falcon 9 compared to the tiny humans into perspective yet again. I never get tired of these shots. The booster itself is still looking great as well, considering it's had four missions at this point, two of them now being the more energetic Starlink drone ship landings. Beautiful work, Greg. Highly recommended following there on Twitter. Now this week, NASA has been celebrating the Hubble Space Telescope's 30-year lifetime since it began showing us the incredible universe around us. In April 1990, Hubble was carried into orbit by the Space Shuttle Discovery and deployed. It of course did have a few teething issues with the primary mirror, which required a repair mission, but I'm sure we can all agree the amazing work the telescope has done over its lifetime so far has allowed it to recoup those mission costs many times over. We need to just take a moment to remember the amazing images we've seen coming from this observatory. It also of course allowed us to measure the expansion and acceleration rate of the universe. It provided evidence that black holes are common amongst galaxies and of course it's allowed us the gateway to look back in time across the vast majority of the universe. Hubble has of course been serviced five times between 1993 and 2009 and it's expected at this point to continue its work through the decade, hopefully alongside the James Webb Telescope which is going to take things to a whole new level after the very delayed mission takes off. Now just a few little shout outs here to some content that has really absorbed a lot of my time lately. Firstly the channel Third Row Tesla here. Tim Dodd appeared on one of the latest chats talking both SpaceX and Tesla with the whole team. Also a video a little older now but one I only just watched a few weeks ago. Just a fantastic interview here with Elon. Certainly check out that channel if you haven't visited before. Secondly, with so many of you isolated away, you may have been wanting to try a little 3D out with a program like Blender. Here is a super quick example of the crazy stuff you can do on this channel here by Harm Film. This just goes to show how quickly you can build out these models once you know the individual steps to model this out. This I think will hopefully provide a little inspiration for all of you budding 3D artists out there. Always great to see this amazing content from the community, links to both of these channels are in the description below. Now just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. You are all quite literally turning this dream of mine of creating content from a hobby into something much more significant. If you like what I do and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included exclusive roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patron only content and you can also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week talking about SpaceX's upcoming Demo 2 mission and some in-depth Starlink information. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.